Hello everyone. It is uh, Wednesday, well for me it's Wednesday afternoon. Uh, hopefully you'll be looking at this tonight, Wednesday evening, the 29th of April. This is our third Thursday to be uh, 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 video, we're meeting together in video, having Bible study with, uh, through video. Uh, I uh, read last night that the governor is supposed to make some kind of announcement this today that they're going to try to start opening things up on May the 4th, which is uh, Monday. So we'll see. Uh, hopefully that's the case, uh, that we'll be, uh, the governor will be opening things up soon. And obviously it won't be uh, just suddenly everybody's doing everything back to normal. But hopefully we can be worshiping. Doesn't look like we'll make it for this Sunday, but at least by a week from Sunday. So keep that in your prayers. Keep everyone in your prayers. Hope you're having a good week so far. Uh, spring, things are coming up. People are planting gardens. It's a great time of the year to get outside, and hopefully you're able to enjoy the outside at least a little bit. So we started our uh, we st started our study on Ro our Hebrews rather uh, one two three three weeks ago. We looked at the an introduction to Hebrews last week. We looked at uh, two sort of little sections of Hebrews. Uh, and this evening we will continue on with Hebrews to the end of chapter two. So I, every week for a few weeks, we'll start with introducing the book, three minutes, uh, helping us to re remember the overall idea and theme of Hebrews, and then we'll launch in uh, to this week's study. So the theme of Hebrews, Christ is better. And this, I'll be having this chart again at least for three or four weeks because I, I want us all to be familiar if you think about the book of Hebrews in six months or a year hopefully you'll be able to remember I remember Hebrews and it's divided up into two neat sections first of all Christ is better than and the list of we have nine things I think that's pretty accurate uh, nine things eight, as we talked about last week eight things that Christ is better than and one thing that Christ is compared to Melchizedek. Uh, then that transition statement in, in chapter 10, uh, verses uh, 19, well, uh, verse 18, 17, 18, um, the transition statement, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, to be in the presence of God, let us. It begins with this, let us, an encouragement or a call for us to draw near uh, to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. And then he talks about how to live out our faith. Because our Savior is better, because Christ is better, this is how we should be. And then chapter 10, verse 19 to the end of the book, a list of at least 14 commands, maybe a couple or more, depending on how you look at them. But he, after chapter 10, he begins talking about the life that we should live as Christians. So, we began last week, oh, uh, the nine, nine things that, that Christ is better than. And this section in the first uh, nine plus a little bit chapters of Hebrews, uh, better than prophets, angels, Moses, creation, like Melchizedek, a better high priest serving in a better sanctuary, a better sacrifice, and the mediator of a better covenant. So the first four of those are, are found in chapter two, uh, chapters one and two. Christ is better than prophets, Christ is better than angels, and Christ is better than creation, Christ is better than us. Last week we looked at the idea that Christ is a superior prophet. In the beginning was the word, John chapter 1. He is the one uh, that we listen to now, long ago and many times and in many ways God spoke to the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us in or through his son. Uh, so. Christ is it. He, gets, he is God's spokesman uh, for those in the Christian age and those who, who belong to God now. The children of God listen to God's Son. Christ is better than angels. Uh, to which of the angels did he say, you, know, you are my son, today I have begotten you. God doesn't call the angels his son. An angel is, uh, a son is better than an angel. Remember, remember the idea that the, an angel is a servant or a messenger. Um, God, God 
Son is superior to God's messengers. To Jesus, he says, my son. To angels, he says, you are ministering spirits sent out uh, to help the saints. So God is, so Jesus is better than prophets. He's better than angels. And so this evening, we're going to talk about these two ideas. God is better than creation, and then God is better than us. Uh, by the way, you'll remember last week we talked about the idea that uh, uh, as we talked about Christ being better than angels, the idea of him being better than creation is sort of embedded in the section of him uh, being better than angels. Be because at the end of chapter 2, he talks about Christ being better than creation and then goes back to talking about Christ being better than angels. So, in this section, this reference to Christ being better than the, than the earth or creation is a parenthetical statement. He puts it in the middle of the, of the discussion of Christ's superiority to angels. It fits well here as a reinforcement that Christ is superior to everything other than the Creator Himself. So the text itself, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. And you, and you, Lord, uh, by the way, the and is, it means another quotation or another statement. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. So a pretty simple idea, isn't it? Um, Christ has built... Christ built the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. John chapter uh, 1, verses 1 and 2. So Christ built the earth. He, he made the earth. Who is superior, the created or the made thing? Or what is superior, the made thing or the, the, the person who makes the thing? Uh, the, the, the maker is always superior. This creative power was already meant, mentioned in verse 2. Uh, verse 2 says, uh, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He gets it all, and he made it all. This idea is important in establishing the ultimate superiority of Christ. So, for whatever reason, God created the heavens and the earth. We are not told that in Scripture. But Jesus, before he became a human being, before he became Jesus, uh, incarnate, God incarnate, he was the creator. He created the heavens and the earth. So he has to be better than creation. It's also a reminder, although Jesus was a son, he is to be worshipped because, because he sits on a throne, uh, and he is the creator. Uh, verses 7 through 10. Uh, going back up and looking at the text. Uh, and you, uh, let's go back. Oops. And you, Lord, uh, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth uh, in the beginning. Verses 7 through 10, though. Uh, of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. So even though he was a son, he was still a creator. And he's not just anyone's son. He is the son of the creator, the son of the Most High. So he is superior uh, to creation. Uh, the, the earth and the universe will one day perish. It will be changed like a garment. Jesus, however, will remain the same forever. Can there be a greater statement of his superiority in, it, in his perfection? He needs not to be changed in any way. And let's go back up and look at that again in the text. Uh, verse 11, they, the works, the, the earth, the created things, will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. Just a little side note about this. 
this is not a place we were, where we were used to teach or establish this doctrine, but uh, one of the ideas about the end of the, of the world uh, is that uh, it, it talks about in, in Revelation, a new heavens and a new earth. We could look at that and say, well, that's just totally symbolic, apocalyptic language. The, the earth's going to be consumed by fire and then we'll be in the ether uh, we'll be, we'll have spiritual bodies, whatever those things are. Or, there will be a new heavens and a new earth. That God will consume this, this earth that I'm standing on right now, that we're all standing on or living on. God will consume that and he will create a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Uh, scriptures say that flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. And that's simply the idea that the the kingdom of heaven is not an earthly kingdom. But it doesn't necessarily preclude the idea that God will create a new, a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I'm not coming down about any particular, uh, <coughs> coming down strongly whether or not that's true, but I said all that to say this is one of those texts that people can point to and say, well, you know, it, the Hebrew writer said the creation is not going to be just wiped out and nothing like it will ever exist again. He calls it here a garment that is to be rolled up and replaced. So it's a garment that is wearing out. I am not wearing any clothes that I wore 20 years ago. I actually have a pair of shoes, maybe. I have a pair of shoes I wore 20 years ago, but I'm not wearing any of the clothes that I wore 20 years ago. They wore out and I don't wear them anymore. So it could be that the earth is going to be rolled up, going to be, in, actually it's clearly taught in scripture that it will be burned up with fire, but, but that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. That's sort of a side note about this text. But the important part, the part that the, the writer really wants us to understand is this very important idea that this created, everything that we see that's created, it's going to end. But Christ will not. He is superior to creation because creation is in for it. The Roman writer, Paul said to the Romans, talked about how the, this creation is groaning. Um, it's not what it should be because of sin. And it's going to be done away with. But Christ is superior to creation. When we think about that, it's, it, I guess it sort of makes sense, but we think about the magnificence of the creation and the universe, and, and for us, as we look around us, the magnificence of that and the, the greatness of that and the, must be permanent, uh, but it's not going to be. Only Christ, uh, Christ will supersede that, and Christ will be, when the earth is gone, Christ will still be. So he is better than creation. Oh, also as part of that idea, can there be a great sta greater statement at the end of the, the PowerPoint? Can there be a greater statement of his superiority in his perfection? He doesn't need to be changed in any way. The notion that Christ, of Christ not needing to be changed is an important motif in Hebrews. The old law was finished and replaced. So if you're a Hebrew getting this letter, and so you're a Hebrew that converted from uh, Judaism and now you've become a Christian, but you think to yourself, well, Okay, the Old Covenant, yeah, it's gone, but man, it was around for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it was right. God, it's not just somebody's covenant, it's the Creator's covenant, uh, so it must have served a purpose. So what about this New Covenant? Is it going to be just like the Old Covenant? It'll be around for a long time, but it won't be around forever. I mean, didn't God do away with one covenant already? And... Hebrews, the Hebrew writer really, really, really gets across the idea and especially addresses that inclination that a Jewish Christian might have that this is going to be temporary like, this covenant's going to be temporary like the last one. No. Because everything is in place for the eternal covenant and the eternal kingdom. This kingdom won't end. Of course, the, the reason why is because of the nature of Christ. And that's the whole point of Hebrews. Christ is not just better, he is perfect. He is the mediator of a better covenant, 
a covenant that is eternal. A major point that the Hebrew writer is making uh, of the nature of who Jesus is, a little bit repeating what I just said and did, his covenant will never need to be upgraded or replaced. He alludes to this permanency in several ways throughout the book. We think about his comparison to Melchizedek. The great comparison there was he was without beginning and without end. He just, in, in, in Genesis, Melchizedek just sort of shows up. And so he is this notion that he is eternal. Um, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, which is often misquoted, but Jesus Christ is saying yesterday and today and forever. In the context of that chapter, the writer is talking about the idea that uh, of teaching, um, but the idea that Jesus Christ and who he is and what he tried to accomplish, what, not he, what, he, what he tried to accomplish and what he did accomplish, that's permanent. The idea of the permanency of it. And again, it goes back to the reason I brought up Hebrews 13, 8, because it is very similar to the idea found here. The idea that this is not going to be, this new covenant is based on who Jesus is and what he did. He, it is not going to be, need to be replaced. So the terms of the covenant, and in that context in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is saying yesterday and today forever, it's the idea that what he says today will not change. And so Jesus Christ is superior uh, to creation. Next, he is, he is superior or he is better than us. So he's better than prophets, he's better than angels, he's better than creation. And finally, uh, tonight, we'll look at the idea that he's better than us. I'll just introduce this idea, that, then we'll read that whole section in 5, 18, uh, 2, 5 through 18, and then we'll look at it. In 2, 5 through 18, the, the writer says some things that are contradictory at first glance. Some reasonable deduction is required to figure it out. <coughs> but the point eventually becomes loud and clear. So far, Jesus has been compared to the prophets, angels, and the earth. Uh, there is something left, something that is better than all of these, better than prophets, angels, and the earth. That something is me, you, mankind. The earth was created to support mankind. So the earth is not superior to mankind. The earth is, mankind is not here to support the earth. The earth is here to support mankind. In that way, mankind is superior. The earth was created to support mankind. Angels, angels minister to mankind. Mankind was the, the, the crown of created things. And Jesus is greater than even than mankind. So let's read 5 through 18. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking, it has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, <clears throat> in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, and this is in parentheses, I, I put this in to help us understand, that he there is Father God, God the Father, for it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So the he in verse uh, 10 is, is God the Father, and then the founder of their salvation is obviously Christ. For he, so the second he, the, the he in verse 11, Christ, who sanctifies, and those who are sanctified all have one source. So Christ and us, we are the sanctified. Christ is the one who sanctifies us. We all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers uh, in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. So the reason I sort of have helped you with the pronouns here is 
you kind of have to understand the context to get it. So uh, verse 11 and 12, at the end of verse 11, that is why he, Christ, is not ashamed to call them, me, us, brothers. Christ calls us brothers. We all have the same source, that's the Father. We and Christ have the same source, and that's the Father. And then in verse 12, Christ would say, I will not tell, I will tell of your name to my brethren. So Christ speaking as though Christ is speaking um, to God. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery, uh, let's see, subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. So this goes back to the idea of our superiority uh, to angels. The construct of salvation, by that I mean God's eternal plan from the beginning to the end, the bringing of the nation of Israel, the bringing of Christ, was not here to help angels. It was here to help mankind because we mean so much to God. Verse 17, therefore he, Christ, had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faith, faithful high priest uh, in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, because he, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay, better than us. The writer begins by explaining that mankind, though once in charge of all created things, is now not, not in, in charge. And very easy to understand, he was told to care for the garden, and the picture we have of Eden and what was going on, that Eden was not working against uh, mankind. And one of the punishments that came after sin was, you know, with the sweat of your brow, you'll till the, till the ground. And this, this idea that there was going to be this angst or this, uh, well, as, as the, Paul wrote to the Romans, this groaning or this travail of the earth and, and how it wouldn't be as it originally was created to help man and to support man. So it's going to be more difficult. And so we lost, there's a sense in which we lost our dominion over it through sin. It may be that angels were included as part of that which was put in subjection to Adam and Eve. And we don't know that for sure, of course. Sadly, the glory that man had in the garden has been lost to sin. So the, the text that we're talking about. So I have an explanation and then we'll read the text. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or son of man that you care for him? So this is, a, in verse 6, this is a rhetorical question. Look at us. We're not that great. We, at the best, we live 80 years, 90 years, maybe 100, if we're uh, lucky or unlucky, depending on how things go. We don't live very long, and Think about the glory of Doug Watts compared to the sophisticated nature of the earth and, and the, the magnificence of the universe and the creation. And just think about me in that. I'm a blip. Uh, I'm, I'm such a tiny, tiny, tiny part of creation. And if I didn't exist at all, creation would still go on. So, so the rhetorical question being asked here, here's man in creation so the natural question is to, to the creator, what's so great about him? What, why do you even think of him? What is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? Verse 7, you made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. So that this idea of being lower than the angels, we're not heavenly beings, we're mortal beings. Um, you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. So, we had, everything was put in subjection uh, to mankind. But, as we said in the chart before, 
We've lost that, haven't we? Again, verse 8. Uh, the last part of verse 8. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. So, God created us. He put everything in subjection to us. But we messed it up. And so, we've fallen. So, why does God even care about us anymore? Christ, like mankind, verse 7 was made lower than angels for a short time. So this comparison is being made. So Christ has become like a human being, lower than the angels, a mortal body. Because of, because of his suffering and death, he has been crowned with glory. So this comparison is made to human beings. God made us, and he, he gave us glory. He gave us dominion over creation. And we messed that up. Now Christ uh, became a human being and... Uh, suffered like we do and had a mortal body like we do but because of his suffering and death Christ's glory has been returned to him he became the author of salvation and brought us to glory through sanctification he provides so because Christ came and he, and he took on human form he became like us uh, Lower for a little while. We know exactly what the little while is. It was, I don't know exactly how long he lived, but about 33 years. He became lower than the angels. But because of the nature of his death, and of course because of his resurrection, Christ has glorified him. And so, and this, obviously the, the Hebrew writer is going to talk about this a lot more later. Because of what he did, he is now able to for lack of a better term, re-glorify or bring Christians to the glory that God wants them to have. Since Christ has become the author of salvation, he has brought glory once again. Again, he has brought glory once again to man. Now we are now Christ's brethren and God's children. It was required that Jesus become like man to bring glory to man. The result of Christ choosing to lower himself is that he renders powerless Satan. It cannot be overstated how important this idea is. Verses 14 and 15 state the fulfillment of the promise that was made at the very beginning in Genesis 3.15. So uh, verses 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, we, we have flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing. That through death he might destroy the one who had power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. So again, this, this great description of the nature of man. He was created, he was glorified, and he was in charge of creation. And he, he sinned, and he degraded himself. He degraded himself. <coughs> but Christ, to fix that, needed to become like one of us. And he became like one of us, but that wasn't enough either. He needed to die on the cross. He needed to overcome death, to overcome the power of Satan. Remember what happened in the garden in the de degradation. All, the, all the, the bad that happened. But God made a promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 and following. He said, <clears throat> the seed of the woman would bruise or crush the head of Satan. And so Christ, in his overcoming death, has crushed the effect, the, the glory. He, he has fixed the, the deglorification of mankind through, that mankind has through sin. He's fixed what Satan damaged so badly. And so through overcoming death, he has brought mankind to glory. In 2.16, the writer answers a question from 2.6. What is man that God is concerned about him? The answer is he doesn't, he doesn't help angels, but he helps Abraham's descendant. Once again, the importance of the phrase to the descendant of Abraham can't be overstated. It is a fulfillment of the great covenant promise to Abraham. So one of the things that the Hebrew writer does, he helps us to understand that uh, the promise of, of being God's children was not just to the Jews. And the promise to Abraham was not just to the Jew. The promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3 was, In you all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the families of the earth doesn't mean just you. So in, in Abraham, everyone 
Christ is going to fix the problem of sin for everybody on the earth. And that was the promise God made to Abraham, and Christ fulfilled that. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. So notice here, too, that he's also intertwining back in, and he's, the main subject here is how Christ is superior to, to, uh, uh, to mankind, uh, superior to mankind. But he, he's also intertwining in uh, and bringing back in the, the argument that he was making at the end of chapter 1, that Christ is also still superior to angels. Actually, in this verse, he's, he's talking about how he gives Christ, uh, God gives help to Abraham's descendants in a way that, and that's us, in a way that he did not give help uh, to angels. In 2, 17 and 18, the writer again presents an idea without an, any elaboration. He will begin developing the thought late in chapter 4. Uh, Jesus is a merciful, sympathetic, and faithful high priest. So, the end of the chapter. Therefore, he had to be made like, a, like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. In chapter 4, uh, we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is tempted in all things like we are, yet was without sin. So one of the great ideas of Hebrews, but again, he's gonna, he, he, he gives us this, he puts it out there, but he doesn't, and he talks about it for two verses, and then in, in chapter three, he's gonna leave that alone, but he'll come back to the idea. It's an interesting little, I wouldn't call it a trick, but it's a device, it's a literary device that the writer of Hebrews use, uses Actually, it's a very Pauline device that he introduces an idea, he leaves it alone, and he comes back later and he expands more on it. So, um, so uh, to review section one through the end of uh, chapter two, uh, Hebrews chapter one and two, Christ is better than prophets, angels, creation, and us. Notice too, uh, I don't have anything in the, the, as much in the book about this. Next time I publish the book, I'll have, I'm going to put this in there. But there's obviously a very important teaching about creation order in this section of scripture. And most importantly, the idea that man is important to God. That we are very important to him. And that he has done so much for us because we are so important to him. The idea that man... You know, we think about angels being superior to man, and in this text it, it says that they are, but I think the only way that they are really is that now they are eternal. They're, they're, they're angelic or, or rather spiritual beings. They're not mortal beings. But we mean something to God. Uh, and I think the Hebrew writer just, just describes that and explains that very well. Let's end with a prayer. Father, we're thankful for this section of Scripture. Christ is better. He's perfect. He's everything we need him to be. He's everything you wanted him to be. He became like one of us. He shared in, in the difficulties of fleshly existence. But instead of sinning, he lived a perfect life. So he is qualified to glorify us. We thank you for what he does for us what you do for us through him. We thank you for what he is to us. We give you praise and honor and glory for that. Help us to have a good rest of the week, Father. Help us to stay healthy. Help us to be a blessing to others. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. See you on Sunday.